I don't do this this side of things. At least you're paying attention. Somebody was at least. That's good to know. I'm sure you've you've run into this too, Bruce, where things aren't working right before a broadcast because you're by yourself. Um, I didn't have a power supply for my broadcast unit in Milwaukee, so I understand completely the stresses of of a broadcast. So that was a that was a, a good stiff reminder that weekend of of the importance of being prepared for <laughs> what you're what you're doing, and I wasn't, and I almost paid for it. That was uh, that could have gotten really bad, but. Uh, luckily, I got bailed out. Yeah, that was just, you know, some great answers and five minutes of nothing going to YouTube. So, of course. Well, wow. that's the best part of the show. They all missed it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the chance you take when you go live, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can't have anything. Well, let me know when you're ready. Uh, Wes. We're, we're good. Go, go ahead and just roll okay. with it. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, Going back with how this team is built, that that does seem to be a theme, though, of uh, a Scott Sandlin team, where you're not going to score, you're not going to be a high-flying team, you're not going to be scoring a bunch of goals, you're going to be responsible in the defensive end, and uh, it, it's kind of almost Jacques Lemaire-esque in, in a way of, you're responsible. You're not going to score a lot. You're going to win a lot of close games. But then early on in the season, you may have a little rough start. And then once the calendar turns, the team seems to pick it up. And that's what we've seen most years. This year, uh, or last year, I should say, we didn't see that. But this year, with last weekend series, it seems like that's back up to it again is it is that something that you've seen too scott coaches the teams that he has um you know his first national title in 10 11 he had a high flying top line with the Connollys and justin fontaine and they were allowed to play that way they scored a bunch of goals that year they they were a very good offensive team a very dangerous offensive team um you know 18 19 17, 18, and 18, 19, those were teams that were built around the defensive core. You know, Perunovic, Mikey Anderson, Dylan Sandberg, Mickey Wolf, those guys. So they were, you know, Hunter Shepard in goal. They were built from the back end out, and they didn't score as many goals, but they didn't give up hardly anything. You know, you think about that 18, uh, 2018 run where the, in the NCAA tournament, the scores were 3-2 in overtime, then 2-1-2-1-2-1. Two, one, two, one, two, one. You're going to win a lot of hockey games giving up five goals in four games. I don't care who you're playing against. So that that's just how they were built. This group, I, I think, you know, ideally, you know, you go back to, you know, last year, there was a way they could win. There was a path and they didn't quite ever get to it. Not consistently. This year, it feels like they're on the way to it. And, you know, as I, as I keep telling people, you know, those games we saw last weekend, those games that we saw in Milwaukee, that's the kind of game they're going to be in a lot. Of, there have been a lot of these overtime games, one goal games, down to the, you know, down to, down to the wire games. Both games against North Dakota that they lost were down to the wire. Both games they lost in St. Cloud were one goal games, down to the wire. That's how they're going to play. That's how they're going to be in, in all these games. You know, they, they're rarely going to get blown out. They're rarely going to blow somebody out. So you have to find a way to win. These are the margins are really. You get these types of games. The margins are paper thin, and if you if you follow analytics, all they'll, they'll tell you that you know in baseball one run games, in football one score games, in basketball single digit point games, and in hockey one goal games. A lot of times that's luck. So you got to rely on that a little bit too. And and frankly, the Bulldogs haven't gotten a lot of bounces, not on the injury front, not in any other, any other front so far this year. So if that continues, it can be a tough second half, but they're playing the way I think they have to play to at least be in these games. Now they got to find a way over the top. And I do think um, 
a lot of especially some some of the teams now like Colorado College they're not as dangerous I mean they're still dangerous on the power play but like without McCown from last year on the power play as soon as you went in the box you were like oh boy and <laughs> UMD we like to go to the box a lot I don't know what it is um but I think that's another key and it seems like they've cleaned that up some for from the beginning of the year to now they they've learned their lesson last year was uh was it Wyatt Kaiser Tomahawk the kid from Wisconsin, Wisconsin. And, yeah. yeah I mean there was just kind of that that was going on but now it seems better and that's going to be another big part of the marginal these like paper thin games is staying out of the box because a lot of these teams like coming up this weekend in Western they again have a really really good offensive team and if you give them any advantage they're going to take advantage of it well um Western I I think they're 30 percent ish on the power play this year something it's just a ridiculous number um they're in 20 games, their special teams net is plus 12. They've scored 22 power play goals and they've given up 10 power play goals. Uh, so their special teams have been really good. And our special teams, you know, our power play has been good, but it hasn't got a lot of reps. And so it, that again brings the margins down. And and what's been good here for UMD is since league play started, they have come way down in the number of penalties taken. And as a result, their penalty kill has taken off because uh, talked to Adam, Adam Krause last week about this, their associate coach who's the architect of the penalty kill. Quite frankly, it's simply a matter of we're not having to use the kill as much. So these guys aren't getting worn down. The teams aren't getting, you know, they're not getting, uh, you know, multiple looks at what UMD wants to do on the kill making it tougher for them to figure it out and, and tougher for them to get a read on it, tougher for them to score on it. And and so since league play started, I want to say UMD's penalty kills right around 90%. If it stays like that, yeah, again, if these games that are raised within margins that they're in, it's 91.2% in conference games, 31 for 34. It's actually right ahead of Western Michigan's kill in conference games. So as long as they're killing penalties and not taking a lot of them, Again, you're going to be in games, and considering how few power plays UMD gets, which is a different subject for a different day, that's a good thing you're not taking very many because you're not getting very many. Yeah, I mean, special teams are one of those situations where they they tend to turn the scales in, in tight games. Um, Western's been pretty good on the power play the last few years, and their power play looks completely different depending on which group of guys is out there. You know, on the the first power play this year, it's Granger on the right side. Uh, Galambos will sometimes slip to that deep left spot. But then on the, the power play two, it's uh, Ethan Phillips on the right who's got ridiculous hands. you got the cannon shot from uh, Sam Colangelo on the left side. And they, they present different looks that I think is giving a lot of the PKs trouble. Well, yeah, and that again, it comes back to you don't want to take a lot of penalties against this team. Um, it, it's just the pace they play at, and it can be a lot easier said than done. But yeah, they, they've uh, they've got plenty of talent. You didn't even mention Dylan Wentz has got 17 goals this season, so yeah, that that's that tells you a lot. You know, Sam Colangelo is a second round pick; he's on their second unit, and it's not like he's having a bad year. He's got 14 goals, so you know. Recipe number one, I can already hear. You know, we'll get Scott Sandal in tomorrow uh, for his weekly press conference, and I can already hear him say, "We got to stay out of the box against these guys." It's a it's a theme every year because Western's power play is getting to that point now. It's kind of like Omaha, where you know Mike Gabinet's done a tremendous job there with his power play over the years, going back to when he was Dean Blaze's assistant. And so when you play Omaha, you know you have to stay out of the box. And Western's getting there. <laughs> the, the kind of team that has that reputation every year having a really good power play, doesn't matter who's on it. Yeah, and like you might un, uh, have a different take on this, but like so far the story has been since Firstweiler has taken over. How are they going to build that offense? They lose their top scoring producers the last two years in a row, and yet they're right back at it. It's guys who have developed in the program, taking big steps, bringing in the right guys from the transfer portal, and they're once again, you know, a top offense in the country. It's kind of ridiculous what they get out of these kids here lately. 
I think it's a couple things. It's something I actually talked to first today about this a little bit. And, you know, it, I think they have a style of play. It's that frenetic racehorse hockey. You know, everything's north. They, as soon as they get the puck, they're going. Uh, and, and he says, you know, yeah, there's going to be mistakes. They're going to give up odd man rushes, but this is how we're going to play the game. And we're going to live with it. We're going to we're going to have some mistakes that we're just going to live with because we know we're going to make plays a lot more often than we don't. So I think it's kind of it's a, it's a style that people want to play in because, quite frankly, it's fun. First off, it's fun to watch, but it's it's got to be fun to play in, right? You've you've got a reputation now of developing these players. Jason Poland just got his his first of the year tonight for the Avalanche. Ethan Frank's having a, a very good start to his pro career. They're turning out pro players. These guys all want to play pro hockey. This is they feel like this is a good step. Let's be honest, the atmosphere at Lawson's a little unique, and I, I think that's also attractive because it, it, it that has to be fun to play in. That rink is it, it's it, it's like a it's like a roller derby atmosphere almost in there sometimes. And that that has to be a joy for guys to play in. But you start to build this reputation, and it's pretty obvious that they, you know they've got skill, they've got speed, they've got size, and They've got guys that want to go, and they're good at it. And that's that's one thing we've had both um, Ethan and Sam Colangelo on on the podcast, and that style of play. Sam actually said he was on uh, once he entered the transfer portal. He was on his way to another NCHC school when he got the notification that Western wanted him there, and he was like. Yeah, I've seen what they've done. Ethan and then Poland and then Ryan McAllister last year, just his one year lighting it up. He's like, I want to go there. And you look at the juniors team that that Sam played on, you have Zegris, you have Faber. I Boldy was on there. I mean, there's half the team is in the NHL already. And now he's showing what he can do where I think the the style that Northeastern was playing um, wasn't as suited to his game as the Western to showcase his talents because it was a, there was a lot of focus on Devin Levi as the goaltender. And, well, Western uh, last year, they showed him. <laughs> he wasn't as good as maybe he thought. Yeah. Two and zero against uh, the big guy. <laughs> yeah, that that all plays a role, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, and Pat has shown, and 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 Hertz, of course, being on that staff too, they have shown that they can integrate these transfers quickly, and and these guys can come in and make an impact. There's not a whole lot of a of a um, you know kind of a in- integration period. They jump in, they're ready to go right away, and and part of that is the style of play. And and part of that is that they, they they've done this before. You know, Zach Lambos last year. You know, from the second he walked in the door, he's an impact defenseman for them. You you start to build that up, and and again, when you go in the portal, depending on what you're looking for, Western Michigan might work for you. And I thought it was very interesting when we were talking with Sam on, uh, because he was the first transfer player that we had talked to, and just how that portal works. It's not like you get to choose where you want to go. It's not necessarily, it's free agency in a way, but it's like, well, you enter it and you got to hope that the right team wants you, which I I thought was interesting because we had, I mean, I had no idea how it worked. Well, you know, and and Brad Schlossman had a story recently about, you know, a lot of these high level, and I'm not going to say that Sam's one of these guys or not, because I have no idea, but a lot of those high level guys, you know, if they're not happy, you know, come January, they're already putting feelers out through their agents, that whole bit. But regardless, you're typically not in this thing very long. I talked to Connor McMenamin about this. Uh, he moved on from Penn State to UMD for this year. And, you know, he mm-hmm. said it, it's not long. And you get some calls and, you know, they're trying to vet you. And in the case of McMenamin, you know, the Bulldogs were fortunate because Scott Sandlin had a relationship through his son, Ryan, who had played with Connor and, and knew him a little bit. And, so they were there was familiarity there, and Connor, having played at Shattuck in Minnesota, was familiar with the UMD program already. So, you know, a lot of times it comes down to things like that, creating the fit that you're looking for. And, you know, 
you don't spend months upon months in the portal. You know, the, the coaches don't have a lot of time to vet you. And frankly, you don't have a lot of time to vet the place you're thinking about going to, to see if it's a good fit for you as a player. Oh, uh, going off the transfer portal, it, North Dakota, they have been one of the most active teams in the portal. And it's, it's both players leaving and players coming in. I don't know. The question is, what's your opinion on what's going on there? Because the way that I look at it, with the amount of players leaving and the amount of players coming in, it doesn't seem like a stable situation, even though last year was a dud, but this year it seems to be working. I Just your thought on that many players leaving and coming in constantly versus recruitment. I will say I don't think that, it, that you know, getting – 10 or, or 15 players turned over every year is a sustainable model. I know North Dakota might have caught lightning in a bottle this year, but it didn't work very, like you said, it didn't work very well for them last year. And I, I think that, you know, recruiting and developing, look at Colorado College. You know, they've, the only guy they have from the portal right now is their backup goaltender, Henry, Henry Wilder, got him from Boston College. I, you know, UMD hasn't exactly been, you know, big time in the portal. They've gotten a couple of guys out of it, and that's about it. Um, I, I think that, you know, recruit, develop, that's still the way to go. Keep in mind, this is the last year that fourth year seniors have the option to come back for a fifth year. Once that goes away starting next season, I think you're going to see a, a very significant dip in the number of players in the portal. It's going to make it more difficult to build a team out of the transfer portal. It's still going to be there and it should be there. You know, a guy like Sam Colangelo, Northeastern's not a fit for me. I need to go somewhere else. You only get four years at this. So you better make it the best four years you can to have that as an option where he doesn't have to sit out a season. I think that's a good thing for college athletes, but it is going, I think that you're, you're going to see the numbers come down significantly. You'll still see some goalies going in. You know, you're trying to find the right situation. Goalies want to play. There's only one starting goalie. Not a lot of teams rotate like they used to in college hockey. So that'll still be a thing. But I, I think the numbers are going to come down and, and, and it'll kind of settle. I don't know what the number is going to end up being, but you're going to see fewer and fewer players having going in the portal. It's going to be reserved for players that are looking for a better situation. And I think, um, yeah, I think UMD this year, we had two players leave and two players come in. And I can't remember, there was, uh, he was a freshman and he left in the transfer portal. And he was a name that I, I it escapes me right now. Howard? But, uh, yeah, Howard. Isaac, yeah, Isaac Howard. I thought you were yeah. being sarcastic for a second there, actually. No, <laughs> like, I, I I was not. I was, because he, I remember hearing his name a lot. And I just, I honestly could not remember his name for this second because I was thinking of Spicer. And I'm like, I know it's not Cole. I know it's not Cole. Um, but then you look at, uh, like you were saying, goalies and different fits, person, he's stuck in Miami. And he had the Bulldogs number I, every time we played. Win or lose, it was like a one-goal game or he'd beat us, and it was just him. He's a stellar, stellar goalie. He decides to go to North Dakota to get maybe a little more in, attention because Miami is not necessarily a well-known program. North Dakota is. We were a little bit worried that, or at least I was, that he was going, because they have a whole brand new defensive core, whether going pro or transfers, coming in, and is it going to be another Miami situation where he thought he was going into something solid and then he's coming out? But it's players like uh, person that, they can shine when they actually have a good team in front of them other than Red Savage and Red Savage, basically. Uh, yeah, and, and, you know, obviously what's happened in Miami, I, you know, I've said before, you know, Miami, when it's when it's going, when that place is hopping and it hasn't been in a while, it's a pretty special place. I think back to some of the battles that, that I've seen with, you know, the Belpedio team, you know, uh, the, 
the Zarnik kid that was just a thorn of a lot of team sides, uh, Riley Barber, Sean Corrali is still in the NHL. Yeah, they had some really, really good teams. And they haven't had that for a while. And and it's it, it's I don't know what the answer is there, but obviously in 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 Ludwig Person's situation, he's looking at that as you know, I'm going like you said, going nowhere here. And this is not a the best use of my talent, I'm going to go try something else. And again, that's what the portal's for. And, and, you know, yeah, it, it, he's in North Dakota and makes it a lot harder to beat North Dakota as we saw in early November at our place. And we'll see it again next month at their place. But it's, it, again, that's, that's what it's for. And you know, good for him for finding that place and good for North Dakota for finding enough defense, uh, enough defensemen that, that can come in and, and make it worth his while. Dominic Bassey for St. Cloud, he's kind of in that similar spot too. Struggled a little bit with Colorado College, came in last year, split time with Jackson Caster, has really taken over the crease there and putting together a solid year for St. Cloud and, and got them going in a in a good direction again too. Well, I'm sure he saw, you know, he may have seen Caden and Barico in the pipeline and thought, well, you know, do I do I want to do I want to stay here? where there's a chance I'm splitting time or do I want to go somewhere else where I may have a chance to be a number one goaltender. And, you know, yeah, he had to wait it out last year. And like you said, split time with Jackson Caster. And I thought they were both very good last year, but you know, Bassey's taken over and he's having a really solid year for St. Cloud state. And he's a big reason why they they are where they are in the standings. And I think um, just speaking of Caster, I think, was it um, Rennick that was the number one and Caster yeah. was the backup. And in that uh, that four or five matchup two years ago in St. Cloud, Rennick was sick and Castor came in, and I was at both of the both of the games. People are sitting there; they're St. Cloud fans. They're complaining about Castor, and I'm watching him. I go, that first game, he was the reason that they were even close in that game. So as soon as he got the number one job, or well quote unquote number one job like he was he stayed another year and was doing that I'm like St. Cloud's gonna be tough and then they get Bassey and that was it's kind of funny to sit there and listen to the fans of the opposing team and go to the opposing arenas when you watch other goalies than their number one like I thought Caster proved his worth right there in because it was, I think it was a two goal game in game one, and then it was overtime in game two. Yeah. And it was like, yep. dang, this caster kid is, he's good. I, I thought he struggled a bit that weekend. Um, I didn't think he necessarily saw the puck all that well, especially. And, and, and you know, St. Cloud had the lead in the Saturday game, and, and UMD had a rally. I, I thought as the mm-hmm. game went on, uh, and the Bulldogs did a good job taking his eyes away, but I, I thought he was fighting the puck a little bit. And then, obviously, it was a defensive struggle for them in the regional against Quinnipiac, uh, you know, a couple of weekends later, and they still didn't have David Rennick back. Uh, that would turn into a, it was a pretty serious illness at the time, and uh, he would have, you know, he, I think he dressed for the the regional game, but he was not going to be able to play in it. Was was the what Brett had told me, and it. But I think it was good experience for Jackson. He understood, you know, what he has to do to be prepared to, to to play at that level. And, you know, he took that, went into the summer, had a good summer. And him and Bassey pushed each other all last year. And, you know, internal competition is so important in this sport. And, and you saw it last year in St. Cloud, those two guys, you know, kind of back and forth. Both, both were really, really solid uh, on a team that I, I thought was was one of the better ones in the country as the season went on. Yeah, they definitely, and even our our preview, because we always go through rosters. St. Cloud, we predicted them still, even with what they lost in, in like a Micah Miller. We're like this roster on paper is still one of the better rosters that we've seen. Um, so I did want to ask you, because we had the commissioner on last week. And uh, it was great. But the move from a neutral site to home sites for 
the the playoffs and and your thoughts on that i'm not necessarily a fan i made it known to the commissioner uh wes is on the side of having the home sites i just want your opinion on that so i'm kind of on the fence and i want to see how it's executed i want to see how it goes before i i I really jump into having an opinion and here's why um i i think it will work and and if it works it's going to be great for the league it's going to be great for the student athletes it's going to be awesome for the fans you know people that that live in the you know in or close to these markets that go into St. Paul out of the picture. If you're a Denver fan, you live in Denver, you're probably not going to St. Paul. That's a flight. If you're a Colorado college fan living in Colorado Springs or anywhere near there, not only is it a flight, it's an expensive flight unless you're driving to Denver and then it's a long day. Um, So you're probably not going to St. Paul for the conference tournament because you're hoping your team's going to be playing the following weekend at much more meaningful games. Um, I, I think that that's affected it a little bit. I, I I am a huge fan of neutral site conference tournaments. I love going to St. Paul. I love calling games in that building. I completely understand why they did this. Uh, from a rest of recovery standpoint, it does make sense. I, I think it puts you in line with uh, with these other conferences that have already gone to this model. I do think that there will come a time where Hockey East and the ECAC have to at least think about it for the exact same reason. You're 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 cutting games off the schedule that in a lot of cases don't really mean all that much of the big picture because you're talking about teams that are already locked in the tournament. All you're doing is risking injuries. You don't need to be doing that at that time of year. These teams need to be getting primed to play the, to play their best hockey when it matters most, to not be having to fight off injuries when it matters most. So I, I think that helps in that regard. The coaches seem to be on board with it. I, I think I'm thinking about like, you know, an NCHC semifinal at Lawson with anybody in there and how cool that would be. And and how, you know, an NCHC semifinal, you know, in St. Cloud or even Duluth, you know, in these awesome buildings we have over here too, and how cool that would be. It's hard not to be excited about that. Uh, but I understand why people are upset if if, if they are upset about losing the, the trip to St. Paul. And I think um, we had an Omaha fan on, and yeah, Omaha has never been to St. Paul. Crazy. Uh, That's crazy. They, he would go with his dad every year. And it was, I like the fact that it was two days. And yeah, the, the coaches are on board. They like this extra day of rest. But for me, it's, those fans like the Omaha fan or it's these these fans that you know what this might be their one trip out of the year and you can go there whether your team makes it or not and I'm just a hockey fan where it's like UMD plays in the semifinals they lose well I'm still gonna go watch the hockey because I know it's great hockey and that that's my opinion on having the back-to-back where now it's I have to pick and choose. Do I go to say Colorado Springs for one game or do I see if they win and then go to Oxford or Kalamazoo for the other game? And there's some people that it's more and it, it, I'm thinking of more of it on the fan perspective, but that's why I don't coach hockey because <laughs> The the coaches, they, they're on board and they do it, like you said, for the injury aspect and why risk it. Um, I'm just thinking more of, and I got hammered on Twitter for this, and it was like, typical UMD fan, you're so close to St. Paul. I'm like, I get it. I, I get that it's convenient for us. But other fans, I... That's the side I'm on. And I love the neutral site where it's like you don't have an advantage. It's for the most part. So I'm clear on this. I've not talked to Heather um, or any of the league officials about this. Um, I just haven't because I'm I'm of the mind that the press release says what it needs to say. The one thing that I would offer up here is, you know, I think back to the days of the old WCHA Final Five because I'm old enough to remember them and Mm -hmm. how, you know, 
Thursday, the, the playing game, even if it's, you know, those Denver and uh, uh, Wisconsin, or for example, you're drawing 12, 13,000 people into Excel Energy Center for a playing game. The semifinals, it's packed. You know, there, there's 18, 20,000 people at standing room only. The championship, it's packed. The NCHC didn't have that. You know, they were lucky to fill the lower bowl. And and yes, it was, you know, 2019 when, when UMD played St. Cloud State, they basically filled the lower bowl for that championship game. It was a great game. It was a fun atmosphere. But it's a, still a half-full building. And are you better off playing that type of a game in a half full neutral building, or are you better off taking it to St. Cloud and filling the Brooks Center? I would argue if you, if this is about student athlete experience, if this is about fan experience, you're better off taking it to the Brooks Center because it's going to be jam packed and there are few buildings that are as loud as that building is when it's jam packed. And that those are fun atmospheres for everybody to be involved in. You might have a headache afterwards because the acoustics in that building kind of suck, but it's still a fun atmosphere to be involved in. I, I think you're better off doing that. And you know, from a business standpoint, it, it sounds like they can make the numbers work. So, I, like I said, I I, I'm, I I will reserve full judgment until I see it, but I understand why they did it. And again, I I get why people are upset about it. It was a tradition for a lot of folks. I know a lot of folks in the cities that are, whether the UMB fans or North Dakota fans or St. Cloud fans, they live in the cities. This was convenient for them. They went every year. They made something, made an event out of it. And they'll miss that. And and hopefully they don't disconnect from the conference or from their favorite teams because they don't have that anymore. Yeah, and I, Heather actually did bring that up where they were hoping that it was going to be that final five uh, atmosphere and it just didn't show up. And um, one of the other things that I brought up to her was just – how is it going to look for opposing fans that do want to go to the games? Like what's the allotment? And uh, she did kind of her answer. It made sense. We got the big picture done as far as, okay, our contract is up. The XL kind of, they basically said, we thought this was going to be a final five atmosphere. We can't offer you what we were offering you. Uh, you can, make your choice from that they made this choice they made the decision and i was like okay random fans or um, opposing fans what's the the allotment of tickets she's like we got the big picture done we still need to hammer out the details and it was like that makes a lot of sense like get one step done one step at a time <laughs> right figure that yeah. out yeah yeah, it's, that's that's the smart way to go about it, and you know they'll figure it out. And and you know obviously it's it's going to be different. You know, Ed Ropes and Arena seats what thirty three hundred people. Lawson seats thirty six, I think it is something like that. You know, Miami has you know maybe thirty five hundred seats in that in that barn. So you know what you can do for you know opposing team allotments in those places is maybe a little different than what you can do at Magnus or at Amsoil or definitely at Ralph Engelstead Arena. But all those, you know, that stuff's going to have to be worked out as we get closer and closer to the date. And um, the other thing, too, is with Arizona State coming in, having, you know, the odd number of teams and all that, uh, I, I do think it, you know, logistically does present some challenges. There's there's a lot of flights in this league now. You know, there are already a lot of flights. There's even more flights now because everyone's going to have to fly to Arizona State. No one buses there. And so that's something else that they're going to have to consider because, you know, whether it's Arizona State hosting on a week's notice or it's Duluth hosting on a week's notice, whoever it is, it is going to be very difficult for teams to get to those places if they have to fly. You know, UMD, if they're going to Western Michigan, they can send a bus. You know, Western's bust here before. We've bust our gear there, I know, before. I don't think they bust the team there before, but that's an option at least for you know, on short notice if you have to do it. Not ideal, but you can make it work. You aren't busting at Arizona State. You got to fly there. And so those are logistical challenges that are introduced here that there are no easy answers for because you obviously not you're not going to know right away who's hosting these games. And that's all stuff they got to work out. And again, I trust they say that they can make the financials work. 
I got to believe him on it. And I do know this, you know, it won't be like the first round of playoffs because in a lot of these cases, the students are going to be back. They're, they're going to be there on off their break. That's going to help these atmospheres. We've seen it at the CCHA. We've seen it at the Big Ten. I, I don't see any reason this can't work in the NCHC. As a Western fan, oh. I am super stoked for this if Western can get to a point where they're hosting that playoff game. Um, I think like the moment I finished reading it, I was like, I hope it's the worst case scenario. And it's like Western and Colorado somehow are one and two and Colorado has got to come here and it's just a pain in the butt for the conference. But I want that championship atmosphere in Los and ice arena. It, there's nothing that's going to compare it to it. It would be the loudest building ever. Oh yeah. Yeah. No doubt about it. It'd be off the charts. Uh, at least, you know, with, with Western, it's not ideal, but you know, somebody could fly into Detroit if they had to, yeah. you know, Miami, where are you going to fly into? Um, because Cleveland's pretty far. Uh, you know, Columbus. the close we fly into Cincinnati when we go there, and that's that's still like an hour drive. But I think that's the closest kind of major airport. And I'm not sure I'd call Cincinnati a major airport. No, you you have to fly into potentially like Kentucky or even Indiana to get anything bigger or closer, really. Because it's that's oh man, that drive. I'll tell you what, I made that drive one time. I never want to do that again. Yeah. We've had to, we've had to go from Oxford to the Cincinnati airport in some gnarly weather over the years. So, I uh, it, it's that's not an easy drive to make, but it, you know it's that it is what it is. That that's that's the trip you got to you got to take it. And you know we'll, we'll see if it ever comes to a point that Miami is hosting. I, I certainly I don't root for for anybody in this league to fail, and and I'd like to see Miami make a jump at some point. I just hope it's not at our expense. I don't remember what year it was, but it was Western versus Miami in the first round of the playoffs. And Miami won Friday, Western won Saturday, and Andy Murray's doing the post game show. And he's like, there's plenty of seats if anybody from Kalamazoo wants to come down here on Sunday and go to the game. And I looked at my, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, and I'm like, uh, you want to drive to Oxford? And she's like, for what? And I was like, uh, game three of the playoffs. So we drove like four and a half hours down. Bought tickets, went to the three-hour game, drove four and a half hours back through just the most podunk towns mm -hmm. of whatever highway, whatever Ohio believes to be a highway system, which they do not have. And I argue against anybody who says otherwise because it's not one. And the speed limit goes from 35 to 55 and then back to 35 to 25 for one red light and then back the other way. That's not a highway system. Get out of here. I'm taking back roads for no reason. Ohio, figure your stuff out. And then Oxford's in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it is. And you know what else they don't what else they don't have in Ohio? Snow plows. We found that out our way a couple of times. We had uh, a <laughs> couple of, of snow and ice situations and, and you know the Sunday morning having to drive to the airport at five o'clock in the morning. And you know, the roads are just caked in whatever just fell out of the sky the last six hours. And this last year we're out there and it's raining so hard. It, it, it sounds like the roof on the arena is going to cave in. It was crazy. Um, we've had some just strange weather on our trips out there uh, in my years doing this. Uh, so I want to move more towards the, the radio side of things with my next question here. You've been around for pre-COVID, the COVID years, and now back to post-COVID. How does a crowd influence how you call a game like on the radio? Or like, does it? Oh, it does. Everything does. I mean, the the, the quality of the game influences it. The crowd. I, I think the crowd plays a role sometimes. The quality of the game, and then that just kind of dovetails in, into what I do. You know, you you're just more into it sometimes. And you know, I'm not gonna lie. There's been some buildings we've been in that have been awfully dead, and it can be a little harder to get going and 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 kind of get into the game because there's nothing going on around you or is it you know most of the time in our league you don't have that problem whether it's western or, or duluth or st cloud north dakota cc the denver the crowd is into it and therefore you kind of are as well so but yeah there's it's i think it's more for me not as much the crowd as it is the game itself if it's a slow pace, a slog, a, you know, kind of a rock fight, as, as, as they might say, 
it's a little harder to get into that if it's a you know faster pace and you know there's some hit and there's some intensity and, and there's some back and forth and and it's just it's a good quality hockey game it's a lot easier to get into that that's for sure and i know wes you probably have not heard bruce call a game but i well, why you not? Do you not have the internet in Kalamazoo? No, I've definitely, heard, I've definitely heard games for sure. Oh, okay. I, I'm not yeah. going to make a Wisconsin <laughs> comment because I know you're uh, a fan of a lot of teams that I'm not a fan of. Uh, but <laughs> I can definitely, when I listen to you, I can definitely tell how the game is going and and the intensity. If it's an intense game, you are definitely in it. And if it's not, you still do a great job, but it, you understand, and it's kind of like um, any play-by-play person on the radio, it, it's like, if there's not a whole lot going on other than baseball, you feel that just that wave of going through of once things pick up you're gonna pick up if it's going down it's going down and there's not a whole lot happening uh but i also do think that sometimes in the games that are not as exciting you've had some gems of calls i mean there are a lot of (laughs) i just start laughing when i'm listening to you (laughs) because i'm like well I know how this is going because Bruce is just going off on a tangent about something. So I feel bad because it's radio, right? So you're assuming, yes, there are people that will mute the television. They'll sync the radio call to the TV and they're saints. I love them for it. That's, I appreciate it. But more often than not, the audience can't see it. Mm-hmm. They have no idea. And so I feel bad, like, you know, if it, even if it's eight to one, you feel like you have to call it. But whether you're winning or losing eight to one, it's not the same as as if it's four to three. It, you, it can't be it, it, because you had ha- the jobs to call what you see. What you're seeing at that point probably ain't a whole lot, um, but you have to call it. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel like you can't like, yes, the occasional tangent is OK, but you can't have too many of them because if you do, your audience has no perspective of anything going on. You can't reset the score every 10 seconds so that they understand this is why we're not calling the game right now because it's, you know, eight nothing with three minutes to go. and I want to go home. Uh, so you have to call the game, but you can't. You also don't want them to think it's four to three because it's not. I'm not going to lie to anybody about it. You know, it's you call yeah. what you see. You, you, but see, it's a balance. And I think it's harder to strike that balance on radio than it is TV because on TV, you can see it. There's a little box on the TV tells you what the score is how much time's left. And so if you're going off on a tangent or you're telling some stories about the players on the ice or the rivalry or, or the game that that's unfolded in front of you that people might've missed, that's okay. Cause they can see the score. They can see the time. They know why you're doing that. You don't have that on radio. Yeah. And I think um, I've done just a smidgen of radio uh, myself, but my dad did it for, I don't know, 25 years up in Virginia and he did a bunch of uh, play-by-play and and everything and it is difficult that that's the thing like you were saying I can watch it on TV and I do the same thing I mute the TV and Vikings games I'll put on Paul Allen and I'll just Mm -hmm. listen to him more or less because it's more entertaining than listening to the national announcers uh but, yeah, Paul's got that way about him. Yeah. Yeah, he he does. But <laughs> you have to describe everything and it would be difficult and that's kind of like I was saying with baseball, well, you got the time in between, but hockey and basketball you don't have that time because there's action always going and you have to describe it to the person that's listening that it's like okay, I can't see what's going on like um, Pionk dumps the puck down around the right hand boards, and uh, uh, Biondi picks it up, and you know, however the whole thing goes, uh, whatever the play is, uh, so that's that's got to be tough at 
in the times where the game is just really out of hand. It is, but that's the job. You got to do the job and, and you're trying to make it interesting at the same time, which is, you know, why I'll sprinkle in a couple of one-liners and, you know, sometimes I'll tell you guys a secret. Sometimes I tell jokes just to amuse myself because I figure by the, if it's six, nothing in the third period, they're probably in a whole lot of people still tuned in. So I'm just kind of a little bit, I, I might as well have some fun with it. Right. I mean, the other thing is it, this is number one, we're, we're broadcasting a sporting event. We're not curing cancer. Thank heavens. Cause I'd be in trouble if we were doing that. <laughs> so it's okay to have a little fun once in a while. It's okay to have a laugh. This is not, this isn't serious business. It's just a hockey game. And it, it, it's important sometimes to and I just as guilty of this as anybody. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay to to keep that perspective because it's important to have it. And I think that that's partly why I even if you was it a couple of years ago UMD was just getting killed, but I kept it on because I'm like at a certain point there's going to be something that's going to entertain me so i just like kept listening i wasn't going to turn it off and i'm like and you're right it is just a hockey game um and it, it's supposed to be fun some people they take it way too seriously and um you know sometimes it does get serious like with the with adam johnson uh who i knew and Beautiful what you did. And then Scotty Perunovich, I also played summer tennis with him. Uh, you brought him up earlier, and I I still will remember him as this little shit that the racket was about as big as he was. That sounds about right. Yeah, yeah, he's knucklehead. But it is a game, and it's a, it, it's supposed to be fun. It's entertainment. That's the whole thing. Well, and I, you know, I could go back to Scott Sandlin's press conference last week and we were talking about Will Francis. And I think it's easy, especially when you're having a couple of tough years and, and these guys want to win. Let's not pretend that anybody is satisfied when you're seven, 10 and four off a 20 loss season. No one is satisfied. These guys very badly want to win, you know, the older guys, the younger guys, all of them, but you know, Will Francis has an insatiable passion for this game and right now it's been taken away from him he can't play again this season and you know, it's after he played five games as a freshman and had a battle through undergoing the treatments and you know this game was almost completely taken away from him and and you know we're glad that, that he's on track to be able to play next year zach stays you know missed a good chunk of of what was going to be a, a pivotal season for him because of cancer, something he had no control over. And, you know, if it took him all of last year, part of this year, even to, to, to get where he's completely feeling right again, well, that's okay because the guy had freaking cancer. Mm -hmm. And, and again, you know, he's, he's show, he shows up every day that he's got, he's got a smile on his face. He's got a great attitude. He's got a passion for this, you know, for this game and this program, you know, being a bulldog and you hope that that, I'm not saying that guys don't have that joy, that passion for the game, but you hope that that perspective isn't lost as, as we go through this season. Yeah. And I know, I, I remember, I think I'm pretty sure I called one of Zach's games uh, back when he was in Grand Rapids. I think he was like a sophomore, but he was playing against uh, uh, Middlestad down here in Edina. And he just had that, that joy there. So I've always kind of, followed him to um uh, Wes I don't know how many more questions you have I have two more uh, I was gonna steal one of yours and then I was gonna see if Bruce wants to make uh picks with us as we pick <laughs> the games every week uh but he doesn't have to since he's you know tied a little bit closer to one of the teams than than usual folks um but that's about where I'm at I mean we've been almost an hour other than that slight hiccup at the beginning that I'll figure out how to cut out if I care to, eh, might be lazy <laughs> about it. Um, so if you want to, I'll finish up the, I'll cool. steal the one from you and then I'll let you finish up with yours. Cause I think you yeah, might know one of the ones I'm going to steal from you. I, I'm thinking so, but I'm not quite sure. So uh, go ahead and steal whatever one <laughs> it is. And if you steal it, you steal it. So Mike, like all good ideas are stolen. 
Right. Keep that in mind. Very important. Yeah. There's no such thing as a new idea anymore. Uh, oh. Mike likes to ask our playing guests, what's their uh, favorite arena that's not their home arena and their favorite city that's not their home city to travel to when you're traveling with the team? Favorite city is, because I've yet to beat a Tempe, um, favorite city is Colorado Springs. We've had some really good luck with the weather over the years there. And uh, looking forward to that late February, early March trip this year and expecting it's going to be wonderful again. Um, favorite opposing arena, I would say Western, but the FCC doesn't like the number of cuss words that are audible <laughs> on my radio broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> and there's not a and there's not a damn thing I can do about it because I don't even run a crowd mic. It just is what it is. Um, my favorite arena, Omaha's up there. I love the view in that press box. Uh, great food in the arena. It's it's an underrated atmosphere. There's some really fun fans in Omaha. And quite frankly, I love being around. We stay around the rink there. It's fan, it's a fantastic area. So that that that's up there as well. But that's a fun arena to be in and. It's a great spot to call a game from. Yeah, putting the press box above the student section may not be <laughs> the best spot when their favorite no. chant is to focus on one particular opposing player. Yeah, and who's yeah. that going to be? Because we don't have a four. We also uh, don't have a three or a five. They'll figure it out. I know they will. <laughs> It'll probably move I, figured, all the... I figured it's two or six, but yeah. nobody <laughs> seems to know for sure. Uh, yeah, I was, trying to, I was unless... thinking about that, too. I'm like... Unless someone takes I, I a blatant penalty, six. it'll it'll default to two or six. They'll they'll figure it out here probably soon. Yeah. I think it's got to be six. It's got to be Ben. I would think so. I, I but the thing is, if I, I mean, maybe I, I would love for them because I think it's it's going to get them going. Um, if I'm Western Michigan, the last thing I want to do is anything that's going to get Ben Steves going more than he already is. Yeah. But they if they want to do that, go right ahead. I, I I'll be happy to call about five Ben Steve's goals this week and if it comes to it. Oh, it awesome. seems to be a double edged sword with the Lost and Lunatics. Okay. There was <laughs> before I think there's the coach before Mayotte and then uh the former U of M coach, they both just did not care. They would entice the Lunatics in some form or another. And I think it was was it the first playoff series that Colorado College beat us to go to the finals? But he made some kind of hand gesture, and then the rest of the series, every time anything happened, every lunatic, oh, oh, for the whole rest of the series. It's like, don't give them any ideas. But then you see teams uh, like Colorado this last year, you know, the second they won and knocked Western out of the, the tournament, what's the first thing they do? They skate in front of that entire lunatic section, and they let them know, like, hey, we beat you in your barn, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it, which doesn't shut them up at whatsoever, and it's one of those things where they'll be happy to to let you know if we've enticed you, but don't incite them either because they'll make it just as hard the next time you come in there. If you even think about being around the puck, you're going to hear all kinds of noise. Yeah, they which are, some some teams will feed off it really well, others won't. So yeah, I think who was it we asked? Was it Luke? Because we asked somebody about like the ability to play in front of a home crowd like that. And then go to an away arena. Like, does having that much energy in your home barn translate to being on the road? And I think they said sort of, but not necessarily. Was kind of the feel of it. Like, you, yes, you want to be a, in a loud atmosphere, but if there's a barn that's quieter than what you're used to, like it, it almost takes you more out of the moment. It could have been Trevor too, because we asked Trevor a lot of things. Um, we've had Trevor Gorsuch on a bunch and. Uh, that dude, he's a riot. He's <laughs> absolutely fantastic. Um, but actually, Wes, that was not one of the questions that I was thinking of. Well, good. Um, the, 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 one of the questions that I was thinking of was, uh, with the new pod system, Each team is going to, every year is going to have a bye week the last year. Yeah, the team's going to have a bye weekend, or at least a non-conference weekend. Well, one, weekend. one team will have a bye, yeah. 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 Um, do you like that? Because 
Heather said they're going to try and give preference to the rivalries, but I kind of like it when, when the teams know this is their year that they're going to have the bye week and we're not going to have to play St. Cloud State 13 times within two years. <laughs> like, I mean, that was ridiculous. It was, it was crazy, fun, yeah. But um, just your thought on the on the pods and, and I, how that's going to work. I like I it. Hope- I hope they're careful here um, just from a scheduling standpoint, because what I don't want to see is a team having to fly to play its last weekend of the regular season and then turning around and having to fly for a first round playoff series. Um, That, that makes it very difficult on not just budgets, but also, you know, the hockey ops people with all these programs that have to put these trips together on very short notice. It's already hard enough to put a trip together on short notice, and then you start introducing planes to it. I, I I don't like that. So hopefully they can avoid that. I, I don't know how you do it. I mean, guarantee it. I, I that's that's how, that's above my pay grade. Thank heavens. I let somebody else figure that out. But um, that's uh, where the hopeful, at least, uh, preference to the those rivalries as they are set up now. Yeah. I mean, the the furthest travel is what Omaha and North Dakota. Unfortunately, just because they got short ends of the stick as far as current rivals. So I think we'll still see a rotation there. It might even be like, you know, North Dakota will play UMD at the end of one year. The next year it might be UMD and St. Cloud. It might be St. Cloud and UMD. So I think they'll try and rotate within the pods. And then whatever team, you know, one team just gets the lucky straw and they don't have to. Because you have to think, like, there could potentially be a chance where Arizona is traveling to Denver for that last week. And then maybe uh, Arizona and Colorado are nine and or eight and nine. And they have to travel to say North Dakota that Wednesday or for that one Wednesday game and then play, you know, North Dakota on that weekend. Well, that the other thing I'm thinking about, like, so the way the pods are set up, it's, you know, Miami, Omaha, Western, it's UMD, St. Cloud, North Dakota, it's Denver, Arizona, and CC. So let's just, you know, let's put our thinking caps on here, guys. So UMD plays St. Cloud, North Dakota plays Omaha. That's fine. Uh, let's say Miami's got the bye week. Who does Western play? Right. Yeah. Right. So that it's that's probably where, Arizona. Yeah. Right. So that's where you got to figure some things out. And and again, they've got plenty of time. And I, I trust this league is is going to do things uh, very smart and kind of what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of pragmatic about the, the the way they handle things. They're not going to jump into anything. They'll do it the right way. They'll figure it out. But what I what I hope they can find a way to avoid is a situation where, you know, Miami's got to go to Denver or you know, even North Dakota because, you know, Duluth's on a bye and St. Cloud's got to play Oma. You know, there's they've got to find ways to avoid that kind of thing because it, it, then it turns into a cluster. It makes things, really like said, really difficult on a lot of these programs and their budgets and, and trying to get these trips planned on short notice. So we'll see how it all plays out. But I trust the NCHC. They've done a lot of things the right way the last 10 years. I'll get this one right. I wonder how many teams, if they're in like that eight nine play in game, are just gonna travel. Like if they're traveled the last weekend, so you know, like you said, say Miami is at Arizona, and Miami's the ninth seed because right now that's kind of where I'm projecting them to be again next year. Uh, they travel out to Arizona. Maybe they have to play, let's just say, at North Dakota that Wednesday. Maybe they just go straight from Arizona to North Dakota because they think it's, you know, I mean, we saw that kind of with Colorado this week or this last weekend. They played Minnesota because it was a Sunday, Monday series, S- drove up or stayed up in Duluth and played Duluth this last weekend and finally went home after that series. Well, the problem with that is that Colorado was on break. That's why they did that. Yeah. Um, in March, you might not be on break. So, you know, it might, it's you know these are students still. Let's keep that in mind. Yeah, but As, again, we we've, we've seen trust a lot. The, I trust they are as well. Yeah, I mean, but we've seen a lot with the whole online learning thing too, and the accessibility yeah. that that has created for these players. I mean, hell, three years ago, every player in college hockey, at least in the NCHC, spent an entire semester down in Omaha. So that's I mean, true. There, there's <laughs> we, we've learned some stuff from the hardships that COVID presented. And I think they've affected a little bit of how we're viewing the world still. And that might be some of the reason why we're looking at things like, yes, there's smaller campus sites, but we've seen 
what streaming services can provide and, and what those television deals can be and those alternate revenue streams that aren't just necessarily butts and seats. I, yeah, I would agree. I, that those are good points. And like I said, I trust the league, so we'll, we'll see how they work it all out and, and what the schedule looks like next year. I haven't seen uh, anybody's schedule for 2024, 25 yet. So uh, when, when that gets revealed, I'll be just as surprised as everybody else is. I'm definitely looking forward to schedule release day. <laughs> they should have they should have stream a TV show or something. Why not? Uh Wes, did you have any others? Because the one that you actually stole was going for the picks. Um, but do you have any other questions? Uh no, I think we can jump into picks and then we'll just go over our records next week. We'll not worry too much about this weekend, uh, other than there were no sweeps this weekend. Well, I, d- I do have one question slash something for Bruce to look out for. Uh, ha- and I know you are a wrestling fan. <laughs> have you ever seen, when you've gone to Lawson, some doofus that has his face painted like Sting standing next to the glass during warm-ups at Lawson? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I'm definitely going to look for that type of thing now on Friday, but I don't think I've ever noticed it before. Yeah, because that will be Wes. Yeah, that oh, will be nice. me. <laughs> I will be over your goaltender's left shoulder. Okay. For the first and third periods. All right, I'll look down that way. Uh, Saturday. Yeah. Saturday my face will be painted. Friday it will not because I have a job that I have to be more professional for. Oh, and, uh, uh, what fun is that? You know, that's what I say, but... Not too I understand. Also, that gets that stuff gets really itchy after twelve hours. So let's not do that. I can only imagine. I he got so many compliments in Nashville, and I was actually kind of surprised <laughs> at that. I I think we were both embarrassed to be with each other, but that's a story for another day as to why he was embarrassed to be with me. Um. Okay, so. Let's uh if you're okay with it, Bruce, we can uh can go through these picks real quick. Uh for the week. If you wanna if you wanna pick with us just for fun, because that's basically what we do. You go right ahead. I'm s i am uh I, I will probably just call for a split in our series and that way I'm not offending anybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll start there. We'll start with UMD at Western Michigan. Uh, Western coming off of their first loss to Miami in what was, I think, 12 games. They're 11-1 and one in the last 12. That home crowd should be rocking. Duluth's getting their defense together a little bit, but, I mean, Western's still a powerhouse on offense, and it's hard to slow those boys down if they get rolling. And if you're taking penalties, I don't I see that being in Western's favor. Uh, I'm hoping that this game is less chaotic than last year, especially the Friday game. Uh, that was nuts. <laughs> yeah, let's let's not play Own goal. Yeah, that's st- I think that's my own team. goal by the team that won the game. Yeah, an own goal on the team that had the power play coming up. Uh, I, I think scored by the guy that committed the penalty. By the yeah, way, yeah, uh, I think first said that is my favorite. I don't even know that what <laughs> that was my favorite post game conference with Fershweiler. Like. I don't know what that first 10 minutes was. That was not hockey. Pucks were going in our net. Pucks were going in their net. Everyone's just scoring. What was that? That wasn't hockey. Best post game ever <laughs> as far as Fersh's career goes. Uh, Friday night, I lean Western. Even though we've seen a trend of away teams producing, I think, a little bit better than expected here lately. The traveling team has gotten it together a little bit quicker. Uh I think Western has something to prove a little bit after their performance on Saturday against Miami. It was not what they want, how they wanted to play. Their execution was off in pretty much all aspects, um, especially really on the power play. Miami took pretty much double to triple what they normally take as far as penalty goes, and Western, I think, got one on the Saturday game. So they're definitely going to want to make up for that. Um, And then Saturday... I feel like this one's going to be a little bit closer. I, I still lean Western a little bit just 
because of how inconsistent Duluth has felt this year. And this is really kind of the thing is, is these are two teams get hot at this time of the year. And so it's going to be really interesting to see which one can build some momentum um, and rebound a little bit from last weekend. Both teams losing on Saturday and kind of unfamiliar territory there. So I'm going to go with a Western sweep, but I expect Saturday to be a little bit closer uh, with the way that Duluth has been playing defense lately. I think this one, it no matter how, like even going back to last year, no matter how hot Western is, I think there's UMD and Western styles kind of match up for, for a close series. It's the defensive style that UMD has been playing versus the high octane offense that Western plays. Uh, I think they're going to be one goal games, uh, two if you count the empty netter, but uh, I want to go kind of with you, Bruce. I kind of want to go uh, a split with Western winning on Friday and then UMD winning on Saturday. And those are the best splits. Yeah. You know, at least for, from my perspective, where you lose Friday and win Saturday, you always feel better about yourself and uh, that's what I think will happen here. I think Western will will, uh, will get on them a little bit more on Friday, get off to a fast start, and, and it'll be too much for UMD to recover from. Bulldogs come back with a much more composed effort Saturday and find a way to win the game. I just feel, one, Western's a little bit deeper this year, and two, I wonder how much Duluth can withstand the, that Western presence. Like That's the thing. If you watch a Western game, they get better as the game goes on. And for whatever reason, it seems like they just wear teams out and they take advantage in that third period. Because the third period, once again, is the best period of Western hockey uh, by a decent margin, too. They've not been outscored in the third period in very many games, if at all, this year. Yeah, like as a special teams, if it comes down to that, Western's got the edge. But, you know, hopefully for, from UMB's perspective, they're not taking a lot of penalties this weekend. And. You know, if they continue with, with strong defensive play, good goaltending, they, there's no reason they can't hang around. I think I'm going to lock this one in as my series of the weekend, too, Mike. Oh, yeah, you think? Oh, I mean, I, I don't disagree with that just based off this. Uh, there's one other one. North that, Dakota. Yeah, I think that one has an opportunity, too. I just think these two teams, their style of play is a little bit better. And I just like both of these teams a little bit more than those teams. That's fair. Um, so next series, Denver at Omaha. I think Omaha has finally snuck into the rankings. Uh, Denver is doing Denvery things once again. Goaltender wise, I feel like Omaha has a slight advantage. Davis came back from injury, played really well. Um, Black Cozy's playing really good again. Denver has this stupid offense. They're like a three-point shooter. If they see the puck go in the net, they're draining shots the rest of the game. And how the opportunity for Omaha to withstand that, I don't know if it's there. But I'll go Denver Friday, and I'll give Omaha the bounce back because they've seemed to have recovered quite a bit lately, and they've played well on those Saturday games. Uh recently too and, and i mean they've had some blowout losses on fridays but big games on saturday we kind of saw that in the western series earlier this year so denver friday omaha saturday for me i'm i'm going a denver sweep especially with what they did last weekend going into the second period down one nothing and then exploding for five goals they what coach carl is doing there is ridiculous in denver it's the not rebuild it's you reload and their offense has found their stride they're clicking running on all cylinders um omaha is a team that they're going to put up a fight but i just don't think that they can keep up with denver i really don't i like denver here too um but i think this is going to be one of those weekends where you know Denver wins one, they tie the other one, and 
and then I'll take Denver to win the uh, the shootout for a five point weekend. But hey, Omaha is interesting to me because I think that they can, I think they can score. They can't score at Denver's pace. The question is, is Denver going to play well enough defensively? And that's been a little more hit and miss than I think David Carl wants to see at this point in the season. But I, they'll find a way this weekend in, in a building, by the way, in Omaha that they've traditionally played very well in. I think the thing with Omaha that we've seen on trend for the last few years is they're consistently inconsistent. Is they can string together wins, but they can string together losses, and you never quite know what team you're going to get with them. Um, they're, they have the ability to be, like last year, they were the three seed. But they also have the ability to be the six or seven seed. And it's it's just, they're kind of a confusing team because you don't know which team you're going to get week in and week out. Yep, I uh, 100% agree. Uh, yeah, nothing, nothing wrong with that, yeah. <laughs> Next is St. Cloud and North Dakota. I'm a little bit surprised this one's not the N- uh, CBS Sports game. Um, I think the historical powerhouses that these two teams have been, the rivalry that these two teams have produced over the last few years would have been the pick for this weekend as far as that goes um it's up there with me for the the games of the weekend uh person he's been it's coming off of an illness uh he only played one game this weekend i like the goalie matchup here i'm pretty sure it'll be person versus uh bassy again i kind of think these will be close games and I like, again, I like the away. I don't know why, but the away team has been producing on Friday nights. I think it's going to be a split. And I'm just going to go North Dakota Friday, St. Cloud Saturday. Um, it, and the thing for St. Cloud is, unless they go to overtime, if overtime hits, I'm going to give St. Cloud the, the advantage in the overtime games. For whatever reason, that has been the North Dakota kryptonite this year. Uh, and it bit him again last weekend. But North Dakota, Friday, St. Cloud, Saturday. Yeah, I'm going to go the same just because I think uh, I think they're, they're two very close teams. And, I mean, if you look at even the standings, they're, they're one, two in the standings. So, uh, and they're only two points apart. I do think it's just going to be on trend like U.S. uh, North Dakota Saturday, St. Cloud, or North Dakota Friday, uh, St. Cloud Saturday. Uh, Stupid Colorado College threw me off with the Sunday, Monday stuff with the Gophers. Uh, But yeah, I I think it's going to be a split too, and I lean the same way. They should just be two really entertaining games. Yeah, we'll be a, they'll be physical, they'll be emotional. One of them might get out of hand. It's just what happens to these two teams sometimes. But uh, I, I tend to think split as well. Uh, you know, these they're, they're too closely matched, I think, for this series not to end in a split. Yeah, I feel like St. Cloud's a little bit underrated this year. Uh, might have been some of their non-conference struggles. But the fact that, what is it, that, 11th or 12th team in the country is leading a conference is ridiculous that they're not getting a little more credit. And then North Dakota sitting up there in, I think still top four, top five range. Um, It's there's some good week, good hockey being played this weekend. Uh, Lastly, we have Colorado college in Miami. I think what I I'll, I'll just go first here. I think um, what I've seen out of Colorado College, for the most part, they've carried on what they showed at the end of last year. 
getting to the championship of the conference tournament. Uh, Imperico is playing really good hockey. They're not shying away. I mean, they beat a very good Minnesota team uh, on Sunday. Uh, kind of got blown out on Monday, but uh, before they played the Bulldogs, I think they've just shown improvement year by year where Miami has not. Uh, and Miami has lost basically their two best players. So I'm going with a Colorado college sweep uh, because they, they have just shown so much improvement. And I, it it's fun to me when Colorado college is good going back to like, uh, when JT Brown was playing for the Bulldogs and Colorado college, they, they were a top school and they were kind of a hated rival. I like seeing them do well because that makes everything better uh, for the conference. And then just an entertainment value where, Hey, you have another team that's right in the fight. But uh, yeah, I think Colorado college sweeps the weekend. I will say don't sleep on Logan Neaton the goaltender for Miami. He has played extremely well, even in the loss on Friday to Western Michigan, played much better the Saturday game, a big reason why Miami was in that game for as long as they were and won on Saturday. Uh, I do give the goaltending edge to Colorado College. I don't know how you don't with uh, Emberco. I think he's on his third goalie of the week award this this week. Um defensively I think Colorado College is stronger than Miami and offense they feel pretty even both teams can score but it's they score inconsistently but the strength of Colorado College is that defense and and their goaltending if they're 1-0 games they're going to be in favor of Colorado College but they can also turn into shootouts just as easily and then who knows what's going to happen but I'll agree that it, it'll be a Colorado College sweep and the Friday game is on CBS Sports. I I don't know what to make yet of of either of these teams, ha- even having seen them. Um, I, I tend to lean Colorado College wins the series. I'm far from convinced they sweep it. I, I think this ends up being a you know four points to two type of deal in some way, shape, or form. I I just I don't know. I, I Miami has played well enough in spurts to make me think if that they can find a way to steal a couple of points this weekend and, and Colorado college, quite frankly, has shown enough inconsistency in its game that I, I think that they can be vulnerable enough to lose a couple of points this weekend. And, you know, I, I just, I, I, it's, I don't know. I, it'll be interesting. I, you know, Miami comes to our place next week, by the way, neat. And I think got hurt in, in the Saturday game against Ooh, Western. Right. He left the have... game with like 10 minutes left. Yeah. So I, is he even available this weekend is a question that I can't answer right now. So we'll see. Uh, but I, I think Miami finds a way to steal a point or two out of, out of CC this weekend, and then we'll see him in Duluth next week. I think that's the one thing too, with Miami that. Yes, they have been bottom feeders the last couple of years, but they're not necessarily getting blown out. And I think it was, I think it was them two years ago in the first round of the NCHC tournament. They lost 2-1 both games to North Dakota. I think that was uh, when I was up in St. Cloud watching UMD. They they play well enough to be in the game. They just haven't quite figured out how to get over the hump to win the game. And that's usually where they're at. That that's how I feel about them, um, and you know I I haven't really watched a whole ton of them this year, but when they had person, he seemed like he was that that catalyst that kept him in the game. They just didn't have enough offense, but they played well enough that they were so close, they just couldn't get over it was like they got one leg over the hurdle but they couldn't get the other leg over when you don't have big time talent and they really don't 
it, again, I go back to what I've said about UMD. The margins are thin. You have to find ways to win games. And a lot of times easier said than done. You know, I go back to UMD's win at Miami before break where it's a 2-1 game in the third period. Miami thinks it scored the tying goal and gets uh, called off on an offsides challenge. It was the right call, but mm -hmm. they didn't sniff another chance, a really quality scoring chance the rest of the game. So those are the breaks sometimes that happen. And I, I didn't think in that case they responded very well to it. And, and the result was there. They, they end up, they end up getting no points out of, of what, you know, they, a game that they didn't start very well in, but a game that their goaltender kept them in for two and a half periods. Um, One other really quick one, just because you brought it up and it made me think of it. So when you're broadcasting, do you have a monitor that you can, see the replays then for because i know it, it's talked about and everything do you have a monitor that you can see replays um see what the challenges are or are you just going off of what's on the the jumbotron uh at amsoil we have a monitor in our booth that shows us what the uh the officials are seeing when they're reviewing a, a play which is very handy um, at Denver, we have a, I think usually there's a TV there that's showing us the, the broadcast feed. So if there's a replay, we'll see it, uh, Colorado college. I'm trying to remember. I've been there once since the new building opened. I don't think we have a monitor in the booth Western. We don't, I usually Matt Wellens of the news tribunes down the other side of the press box for me. And usually I can get a hand signal from him on a challenge or something. And he'll at least give me an idea what, what's hap what happened on the play. Cause he's right by with the reviewing stuff. Okay. Uh, Miami's Miami's kind of the same way. Uh, he's kind of flying blind in a lot of cases, but it, it is what it is. And I'd like to, I'd like to have a setup like we have at Amsville everywhere where I've got a monitor in the booth and I can see all the replays and I know, I, I know what they're looking at and I know what, what to, to tell the people that, that are listening what what's being looked at and, and what happened on the play. Yeah. Fans at Lawson have no idea. And I think most arenas, if you're in the seats, you, you don't really know what's going on because there's what that rule no. that they're not even allowed to broadcast the, the replays during a review, um, yep. which just adds more question marks. And it's why a lot of in seat fans hate referees during the game. Um, so to that regard, I mean, the, the at-home fan gets a, a little bit of a leg up there. And, yeah, it would be nice to have those things to in make things more aware if someone watches the game back or they listen to the game back of what exactly was being looked at or or, or reviewed. And I think it's, it's also helpful where – I know Wes can attest to this. When I'm watching on NCHC TV and I – I see something or like if watching a football game when the Vikings were playing the line, it's like, I don't know if that was the right call. I'm realistic about it. A lot of fans, no matter what, they're not going to be realistic about it, but you're also the same way where it's, yeah, that was the right call. It sucks that it went to, or it went against the Bulldogs or it went against whatever team, but it it was the right call. We did that and, this weekend with the Omaha North Dakota game. Right? The the late goaltend possible goaltender interference, I think it was. Yeah. Yep. Where we were literally like, Do you think that's the right call? I a hundred percent agreed that it wasn't goaltender interference. You clearly see the the Omaha kid try and pull up and he just gets kind of run into and the goalie kind of comes out and makes first contact with him anyway. Um one of the few times I've agreed with certain calls, but yeah, it's just, it's helpful for fans to see what they're doing because a lot of times we're left in the dark. Yeah. I think communication could be a little bit better. Um, just, you know, what are we looking at, you know, and, and then when, when they're done, you know, why did we call what we called? We saw it in the NFL game yesterday. Uh, you know, it's pretty obvious they called what they called because the ball hit, they felt the ball hit the Pittsburgh receiver's helmet. But number one, that's not obvious when you look at the replay. And number two, you never at any point said that, that was your ruling. So we're just, we're left to assume that should never happen. You have a microphone. Tell us what you, what you're looking at. Tell us what you saw, what, why you made the call you that you made. And then we can all move on. It, it, it shouldn't be like pulling teeth 
to find to figure out why a call was made. Mm-hmm. Then the, the, this phrase "clear and obvious" comes up, I think, in almost every sport, and we have to be. I think we have to be okay with certain calls maybe going against our team if they're not clear and obvious. If you're spending te- like five, ten minutes looking at a view and you've got it slowed down to frame by frame, that's not clear and obvious. That's you using, granted, you may be getting the call right, and I have no problem with getting a call right, but stop using the term clear and obvious if we're going to break it down to that level. No one's seeing it at that level but but the guys in stripes, and then they're not explaining what they saw at that level. No, I agree. I, I think, uh, I, and I think in general, too many calls are overturned uh, because they're slowing it down and looking frame by frame and that whole thing. And uh, they're, they're, you you can lose very easily the perspective and the context of a play when all you're doing is looking at a frame by frame. It, it just makes it to me. It makes the job more difficult, not easier. Yeah, the game's meant to be played at full speed. Unless you want to add a, an, an extra referee and off ice official whose job is to just watch the play on cameras and can make calls from off ice. Like we shouldn't have to break it down that far. The clear and obvious thing should be the goal. And if it's not clear and obvious, then don't make the call. Yeah, I would agree. And it's, I, I keep having a list because um, there's a guy that is on a trivia team where I go play trivia every week and he's a CCHA official. And it's, I've talked with him before and, I just have questions for him where I want to get in contact with him because yeah, I know it's a different conference, but still like, how do you go about this? Not malicious, not because they have such a tough job. They, they do, but like, what's the process? How do you go about these? Like, you know, what do you do with this? What do you do with that? And just get an official's perspective on things because the highest level I ref was Bantam's. I don't know this high level. Like, I don't know what they're seeing. And yeah, I want to get back into it. But when I was living in the last place I did, the conference was Edina, Eden Prairie, Minnetonka, YZ, and Hopkins. Well, we know how many NHL, well, at least Division I, but then NHL players come out of that. I'm like, I'm a decent skater. I ain't that good. (laughs) Right, we have one... I can't skate at all, so I have no I have no say on this. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from the chat here, and then we'll we'll work on getting you out of here. Um, during the good because my battery's going to die in my laptop here pretty quick. <laughs> yep. Right. During the Western Miami series, um, the Miami radio guy kind of made a a reference to being called to the principal's office for some of his opinions of officiating. Uh, is there a limit as to what you guys are or are not allowed to say in regards to your opinion of officiating or in general, what what you're seeing? Is there a limit? Yeah, there's a limit. Oh, absolutely there is. Um, do I know exactly where the line is? No. Uh, <laughs> have I been have I been reprimanded in, in the past? No. I've been asked some questions and provided some clarification on things, but I I wouldn't say that I've been, uh, you know, I, I haven't, but we all got a, a note once from Josh Fenton about a couple of things that were said during broadcasts. And I can just say that I was not one of the people that was responsible that weekend. So you know, I'm just, <laughs> just saying, um, but no, you, you, you have to be careful. You have to be mindful. Um, I don't think that, I think we've had some games this year that that have not been very well officiated. I don't think that anybody's got a problem with me saying that, but I'm not going to go down the road of questioning the integrity of anybody. Um, I try not to call the anybody out by their names. Um, in a lot of cases, I know who's making whatever call, but I'm not going to do the, well, that guy, no, we're not going to go there. Um, it, it's, it's a team effort as far as I'm concerned. If I don't think they've done a great job, I'll say that, but uh, yeah, you can't, to me, you can't, you can't attack them personally and you can't attack their integrity because as far as I'm concerned, that's, they're not biased. You miss a call, you miss a call. They're human beings. And so you can't lose that perspective either. I think you, when, when I have listened to you, I think you do a a very good job of that where you're, 
you know you can be critical of the officials just like a fan, but you like you said, you don't call them out individually, and it's more of the fans' perspective of, I don't know what they saw. Like, this is what it looked like to me. I, They called it like this. I didn't see it. I don't think it's a very good call, but you're not you're not attacking them. You're not degrading them. You're not going over that line. And it's fine to be critical. Uh, so I enjoy that. Now, do I get up in arms as I'm driving up 35? And I'm like, yeah, that probably was bullshit, whatever. Like, maybe a little bit. But I, I feed off of your energy, too. <laughs> uh, but I think you do a really good job of not not going after them and just more or less questioning why certain things were called and just stating, I disagree with that based off of what I saw. Uh, one, thank you for that too. Um, the other thing too is, is, you know, like you said, you, you don't know what they saw sometimes. That's acceptable. I, I, and sometimes you can see on the replay, you can see what they're looking at and, and maybe things that obstructed a, a, a an official's view of, of what happened on a play. Um, those are good things to see. Uh, the helmet cams you see sometimes that they wear in the playoffs are really helpful because you get an idea of of what they have to look through, what they have to see around in order to catch all the things that happen. Um, and the other part is you have to understand that your team's going to get a break once in a while. And if you're going to rag on them when they give the other team a break, you better at least mention when they give your team a break, yeah, we'll take it. But at the same time, you know, I, I remember CC's first penalty on Saturday. I thought was a very, very soft call, and we said so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's the main thing. It's it you take the breaks to, when you it, get them, but you have to recognize when when it's on the other side too. Rule number one: call what you see. Whatever, if you don't see it, don't call it. But from my perspective and theirs, call what you see. All right, on that note, I think we're going to wrap up here. We've been going a little bit longer than maybe we intended with you. Um, but it was a great conversation, so I hate to cut conversations that are flowing short. Um, but we'll wrap it up. I do want to thank you very much for all of your time. It was, like I said, a great conversation. Um, personally, I put you maybe right under Robin Hook, but that's because of personal bias, and I like my radio <laughs> guy more than yours. Uh, there's some that I absolutely <laughs> refuse to listen to whether it's on nchc or i happen to be driving through their neighborhood and they're on my radio i will not listen to so you're right up there with with our own as far as who i prefer to listen to um i will mute the umd tv broadcast nine times out of ten and either throw you or robin hook on on there so uh yeah, I got my opinions on that. <laughs> I know I like our TV guys. I have no problem with them. I like to make fun of them, but I have no issue with them. I also don't. I mean, I don't hear a ton of their work, right? If I'm watching a game back, yes, but I'm usually there when they're working. So you know, yeah, yeah. Now they've made some silly comments that I'd rather just not listen yeah, to. It, we um, all we all like what we like. Yeah. So again, I greatly appreciate your time. Um, there's some normal YouTube things below. There's a like button, a subscribe button, a comment button. You can make use of those if you choose to or not. Whatever. Your people make decisions. It's a cool thing to do or not. Whatever. Uh, there's a team. Nope. There's a Gold Horns and Fight Songs Twitter handle that is missing some letters. Figure it out. I don't want to spell it today. There's a <laughs> Gold Horns and Fight Songs Gmail. Uh, it's all the words with all the letters all squished together into one big long one with at gmail.com at the end of it. Uh, that's the show. I hope you enjoyed our guest. We're out of here. Until the next one. Bye. All right. Thanks, Bruce. That, that was awesome. Your timing is good because I've got uh, uh, about 10% left. So. All right. Well, we can let you go. Uh, yeah, we'll plug you right overnight. It's all good. Yeah. That was awesome. We...